Hey there, this is Ahmed Mustafa again. Uh, you are most welcome to the Valley of the Kings. Uh, this place, back in the ancient Egyptian times, was called Taset'at, which meant the Great Place. Uh, the full name, the Great Place of the Millions of Years. But before we talk about the Valley of the Kings itself, let's, for, let's try to go first uh, through the development of the burial process in ancient Egypt, starting from the prehistoric periods until we get to the Valley of the Kings in here. Uh, during the prehistoric periods, the ancient, Egyptian, uh, the ancient Egyptians uh, used to bury their dead people in an oval hole that was dug into the ground like this, inside which they placed the deceased in a uh, squatted uh, position, or a fetal position, to prepare him for his rebirth or his uh, resurrection, with some grain around him and some pottery jars as the first idea of the offerings to the dead. And when they noticed that the bodies that got lost out in the desert got petrified under the hot dry sand of the desert, use, they used to get the sand from the desert, pour it on uh, the bodies inside their graves to help their uh, natural uh, preservation. Then they put a big pile of rocks on top of the grave <clears throat> just a big pile of rocks to indicate the place for the uh, relations to come and pay visits later on. Then, during the archaic period of the first and second dynasties, the kings of Egypt were buried inside mastaba tombs. What is a mastaba? It's an Arabic term that means a bench, like this one we're sitting on. This is called a mastaba. The mastaba is usually composed of two main parts. You must have a superstructure above the ground level, a substructure under the ground level. Let's say that this is the ground level. The superstructure is a rectangular building with sloping walls and a flat roof from which a shaft led down to the burial chamber. X is the body of the deceased. So what is the development here? That the big pile of rocks on top of the grave took the shape of the rectangular building to indicate the place of the tomb. And the hole went deeper under the ground and they connected the two with the shaft. All the kings of the first and second dynasties were buried in uh, mastaba tombs that were uh, built either in Saqqara in Lower Egypt or in Abydos in Upper Egypt uh, here. Then came the King Zoser or King Joser or King Neterighet or the one with the divine body. King Joser had a genius architect called Imhotep. So he ordered his royal architect Imhotep to build him uh, a mastaba tomb in Saqqara. Imhotep built his fear with a mastaba, but then he enclosed it with a huge stone wall. So maybe when the king was on a visit to his future tomb, he said to his architect, I cannot see my mastaba from the outside of the uh, wall or the enclosure wall, so make it higher, raise it up to make it uh, visible from outside the wall. Or maybe because the king claimed divinity, he wanted to have a staircase that will take him or would take him to heaven to join the gods up in the sky. And that's the reason, maybe that's one of the re or one of those is the reason behind the uh, modification from a mastaba to uh, uh, multiple or multiple mastabas. Anyways, Imhotep, the architect, had to enlarge the existing mastaba and then he added another one on top of it. Uh uh, not enough, higher. So he added a third one, then a fourth one, then a fifth one, then a sixth one, until we had six mastabas, one on top of each other, with a total height of 62 meters. 
about 200 feet, roughly. This is what we call today the Steppe Pyramid. And this is considered as the link between the Mastaba tombs and the pyramidal shaped tombs later on. And it simply represented a stairway that led up to heaven. Then came the King Senefro, and King Senefro was the first king of the fourth dynasty. King Senefro ordered his royal architects to build him a complete or a true pyramid. But it was the first time ever to try building uh, a true or a complete pyramid. So they actually miscalculated the angle of the pyramid. It was too, uh, too wide open, as if this building was going up forever. To finish it, they had to modify the angle halfway up to have less weight added to the uh, pyramid on the top because they noticed that the structure started cracking at the bottom because the nature of the bedrock in the shore was too weak. It could not take such an enormous weight. So the whole structure looked like this. They started with a 54 degree angle and then to finish the building and have less weight added on the top, they modified the angle to 43 degrees. Of course, this is what we call today the Bent Pyramid. Of course, the king was not content. What the heck is that? I wanted a true pyramid and you give me a bent one? No. Start all over again. So one mile away from the Bent Pyramid, they had learned their lesson. And they started from the beginning with the 43 degrees angle giving us the first complete pyramid in the ancient Egyptian architecture known today as the Red Pyramid of King Senefro in the Shur. It is called the Red Pyramid because of the color of its casing. It's made out of a reddish kind of limestone. If you ever visit Saqqara, look south and you're gonna see those two giants out in the horizon. They are built by King Senefro in Dashur, 10 kilometers to the south of Sakkar. Then all the kings of the fourth dynasty, Cheops, Kephren, Mykerenius, they were all buried in pyramidal shaped tombs that were built on the Giza plateau to the west of Cairo. Tombs are mostly located on the west. But those pyramids, why the pyramidal shape was so sacred in the ancient Egyptian mythology in general? Because they believed that this is the sun got up in the sky and this is earth. So the rays of the sun would come down to earth in the shape of a pyramid. It is so clear in Egypt when it's partly cloudy and you can get to see the sunlight shimmering down through the clouds forming beams of light that form a giant pyramid of light connecting the earth with the sun or the sun down with the earth. So they believed when they built the tomb of their king in the shape of a pyramid that they would help the king to ascend on the rays of the sun to join his sun god up in the sky. Then he, he navigated around the, uh, around the sky on a boat together with his sun god there. That's why next to the big pyramids of Giza, they buried boats. But those pyramids, those structures were too obvious, as if you're telling people that there are tombs of kings full of treasures, please come and rob them. So eventually, all those pyramids were robbed and plundered, especially during the first intermediate period, which was the time of decline that followed the fall of the old kingdom in ancient Egypt. Later, after the country got reorganized in the Middle Kingdom era, in the 12th dynasty, the kings used to build much, much smaller pyramids out in, uh, in size, much smaller pyramids in size out of very weak building materials. 
mainly crossed walls of uh, mud brick with a filling of rubble and debris and then they gave it a white casing of uh, limestone to make it look beautiful from the outside and for the idea of the safety of the burial chamber with the uh, mummies and the treasures of kings they used to make so many passages and corridors underneath each uh, pyramid to disorientate and all mislead the tomb robbers their architects were so their architects were so skillful with those passages and corridors to the extent that it took the tomb robbers 300 years to reach one burial chamber three successive generations of tomb robbers because it simply looked like a maze underneath each pyramid also in some of the pyramids the burial chamber was dug inside a single block of stone and it was carved from the top when the robbers went around this block, they couldn't see a single trace or a joint to indicate that there is a room inside it full of treasures. Eventually, and unfortunately, the robbers figured the whole thing out. They hacked into the burial chambers, they grabbed all the gold out, and then they set fire in the mummy of the king. Because they were so much teased from him and from his royal architects, they gave them such a hard time to find their treasures. So again, the idea of passages and corridors was proven wrong because the robbers could still see the pyramid on top of the tombs. That's what made the kings of the new kingdom era here in Luxor to think of another solution for the problem of robbing the tombs. They just gave it a thought and said, okay, a funerary complex of a king had to be so huge, it had to be composed of four main parts. You have to have a big valley temple built on the edge of the cultivation, then a long causeway flanked by sphinx of the dead king sometimes. Usually the uh, causeway is 500 meters long, leading to a mortuary temple, and then the tomb with the mummy and the treasures was dug right in the vicinity of those buildings. So the king said, once the robbers saw those huge buildings, they knew that the tomb must be somewhere in the vicinity, and that's where they kept looking and digging until they got to it. And the king said, why can't we just build those buildings somewhere visible to the people, and we hide the tombs with the mummies and the treasures somewhere else? The first king to do so, so far, is the king Tutmosis the first. King Tutmosis the first had another genius architect called Inini. So he ordered his architect to look for a perfect hideout for his tomb. Inini took his expedition of men. He wandered around the western Theban hills until he reached this valley. But why did he particularly choose this valley to serve as the burial place of his pharaoh? Look up there. What does the mountain look like? A pyramid. So we have an actual rock formation of a pyramid. So why bother building an artificial one? Also, this is a perfect hidden pyramid because only from this angle, from the valley of the king's side, it looks like a true or a complete pyramid. You will not be able to miss it on, the way, on your way into the valley. And from the outside of the valley, facing the east bank, the side of the living, it doesn't look like a complete pyramid. So it was a perfect hidden pyramid. Also, this place is very hot and dry, and this helped the preservation of the mummy of the king. It needed to be kept in a hot, dry place and not in a humid place near the river. Also, in this valley, we have the best layer of uh, limestone, which is so easy to cut and to decorate. And this facilitated the making of the tomb of his majesty. Because all what they used to carve through the bedrock back then were some bronze or copper chisels and wooden hammers. And as we know, limestone is a soft stone. It's a sedimentary kind of stone. This place is so close to the river as well. Why do we need it so close to the Nile? Because we need to think of the huge blocks of stone that were used as sarcophagi inside the tombs. Sarcophagi were usually made out of uh, rose granite. 
And where did they get granite from? From Aswan City. Aswan City is roughly 250 kilometers away from here to the south. So they were chopping off those gigantic blocks of granite, loading them on boats. The boats made their way down here, all the way to Luxor. And when they got here, you don't expect them to drag those heavy blocks of stone for miles and miles out in the desert. The place had to be as close as possible to the river for the transportation of the sarcophagi. This place is a wadi, or a valley, as you can see, so it's much easier to guard. So Inini, the architect, said on the walls of his own tomb, I was ordered to dig His Majesty a tomb without anyone seeing or hearing anything about it. Nen Ma'a, no one to see the tomb. Nen Sejem, no one to hear about it. So the location of the tomb was actually supposed to be a secret. Originally, it was a very simple plan to come here in secrecy, dig His Majesty the tomb. Whenever the king died, he was supposed to be entered. The tomb was supposed to be covered up with rubble and debris to make it look natural and never sit foot here again. But of course they were wrong because they had hundreds of workmen, artisans, stone cutters, plasterers, painters participating in the making of the tomb. At least one or two of them could easily reveal the secret. Also, after the workmen themselves saw that huge amount of gold getting buried out in the desert without any guards or any protection, they used to come back after the whole thing was done, easily identified the location of the tomb because they simply worked on it for years and years and they reopened the tombs and they grabbed all the valuables or the treasures out. That's why we always say that most of those tombs were robbed and plundered systematically throughout the ancient Egyptian history by the workmen themselves. Apart from the tomb of the king, Tutankhamun, that was found nearly intact. Because there was an attempt to rob his own tomb by his own workmen. But thank God that the robbers were caught and the tomb was reclosed until it was discovered or rediscovered by Howard Carter in 1922. Sometimes you get the question, by the way. Why didn't they kill those workmen after they finished the job? Another simple question. Who would have worked for the following king? You see the dilemma. Also, such expertise of skillful workmen was so hard to pass down from one generation to the other. That's why it took them like a lifetime to transfer such skills. That's why in ancient Egypt, a son of a builder became a builder, a son of a painter became a painter, and so on. Thank you.